Then they were falling from the air and the ground. They were falling from the air? Yeah. <laughs> air <laughs> zombies. <laughs> air zombies. Yeah. Wow. They... Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Game. If you are new and you don't know what The Game is, we are a tabletop talk show and podcast brought to you by Dungeon Studios. We go beyond live play and talk about everything from Session Zeros to Campaign Heroes. We are your hosts. I am Amber. We have Russell. And today we have a special guest with us. Albert is someone who is going to help us out with a little thing that we're going to be going to. We've talked about it in some previous episodes. If you don't know what the dead wars are, then I'm going to link in the what did I call them before? The blah blahs. I'm going to blink link in the blah blahs up here about our episode where we talked about dead wars and how we're going to be there and we're mm-hmm. going to participate. And Albert here is going to DM at our table. So Albert, would you mind introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about yourself and how you how you got into D&D, how you became a nerd, any of that stuff? Okay. Uh, I'm Albert. Uh, I've been DMing for roughly four, a little over four years. I've been a big nerd since as long as I can remember. Uh, my parents got me comics. I've been big on movies, anime, you name it. Um, you can see on my shelf, I have a little anime and Marvel <laughs> display. <laughs> I love it. Getting into d and I've heard about it when I was younger, but it wasn't until after I got out of high school when I started to delve deeper into it. I studied to be a film writer. Oh, really? And, yeah. Similarly. Uh, <laughs> oh, nice. I, I was I was kind of stuck and I was looking for just some outlets and D&D kind of showed up and I realized how great of a creative outlet it was right. for that, you know, writing campaigns and running them and kind of being behind the scenes and setting up all these adventures for people, I think really helped and was a lot of fun. And I've been doing it ever since. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you, see, so study to be a film writer. That's that's really interesting to me because I too have been down that road. Um, and I was curious, which where did you study? I went to UVU for a few years. I didn't finish, unfortunately, just had some financial issues and just that- recently trying to get back up but that's um, not honestly in my opinion you know the, the, what pieces of paper you have <laughs> and and what your talent and skill are are two separate issues you know i appreciate that it's a lot easier when you have the support and resources right now i'm like doing what i can with what i can right you know i mean you can see my camera's not the best yet but just trying to make content as much as i can you know right yeah well goals and objectives man that's the thing you said you've been a nerd for as long as you can remember and that your parents bought you comics are your parents also like quote unquote nerds are they into all the same stuff 100 percent. i yeah me, me and my dad definitely share that interest big time i he's the one that got me into comics especially the x-men spider-man you know all that jazz like we cool. we, we watched all the movies together it's kind of like a good pastime for us that is so awesome (laughs) that is inspiring when your family are into it in that way you know it sort of helps you carry it forward in in a certain way my my parents on the other hand are not at all geeks they're not at all interested in that sort of stuff so i've got to carry the torch all by myself (laughs) right that's what i was gonna say was i feel like when the parents introduce it there's a little Mm. bit of normalizing whatever it is Mm. unless you're told otherwise by society or your friends if you Mm. don't get that because your parents are like this thing is cool (laughs) then i don't know that makes it a little easier well that's great Um, that's you know really lucky i think in that case what was the initial interest in D &D? what what was the thing that you said i need to learn how to play this i had gotten somewhat interested in it while i was in college i ended up buying the player's handbook monster manual and dungeon master's guide i didn't actually read them or in fact open them until maybe a year after that oh really (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, it, it can be kind of tough. Uh, I mean, I myself, I'm a, I was a little bit more introverted going to college. I was, I was, it's hard to kind of approach people like, hey, do you guys want to play a game or do this, do that? Especially when I have no idea about anything about D&D. Right. right. It wasn't until a friend of mine from work, Brian, he kind of tutored me into, I call him my D&D sensei. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, he was a big nerd, kind of showed me everything and kind of taught me like, yeah, d and not strict on rules, you know, like it's if you're running the session, that's your world, the books 
and the dungeon masters guys there just as a guide to kind of take you to what you want to do right just tools yeah and so have you met any players that have kind of chafed at that not at that sort of idea have you personally come across any players that are really rules heavy and expecting you to run everything exactly according to the rules early on (laughs) well early on i definitely did and it was my first game that i was an actual player and it did kind of almost turn me off a little bit of it from it i think the experience was uh one of the players was playing as a goblin and the other player was a uh, no sorry not goblin kobold Mm. the other player was a paladin initially they just wanted to kill the player on one hand i'm like okay yeah they're they're viewed as bad but there's a lot of times where it's like over the table it's like okay well this is a player make it make make it work work. yeah yeah you have to work together as a team we've talked about this on the show right it's it's, have we certainly have i say to my players that they have to create characters that have stronger bonds than conflicts because the team must work together and that needs to be established right there at session zero right make yeah. sure that they understand that before they get to the point where they're in conflict you know don't even make characters that are going to be in conflict that's just stupid yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's just pe- like i mean if this is escapism it's so you created a character that wants to fight like is that what you want to do in your escapism fantasy <laughs> i mean well fight people. monsters yes but like fight yeah. your your Compliment. party yeah sorry to interrupt please keep going oh, where were yeah. we what were we talking yeah, about we're <laughs> asking him about he, uh, oh, so you bought your, your you bought the sensei. dungeon master's guide oh yeah your sensei the DMC. yeah I did play a few games here and there, just kind of join some people's games, not super consistently, but it gave me an idea of what I wanted to do as a DM. As a player, I don't think there's much you can do, but I think as a DM, you can steer that and steer players in the right direction or just call an audible altogether. Hey, let's not do that. Let's move this on. Another game I remember, it's quite the story, very novice at playing. I joined a group at my work and we were level four characters. I joined for two sessions. The first session, a player died from being stomped on by an elephant oh no (laughs) and then the second session uh, we were fighting raid after raid of i want to say army uh soldiers and we were just in the ditches with whatever we had with whatever bows and daggers i think it was almost a two three hour session of just us right there taking turns going up and down trying to survive (laughs) Uh, so that was pretty insane. Sounds intense. Yeah. Those kind of helped me form what I wanted to do with when I started DMing. And I think my first real game was with a group of friends that had never played D&D. I kind of knew everything and had to guide them, which I think helped a ton. So well, it's I was like going to say, it feels like the pressure's off when you know, you're DMing for people who don't really have any kind of expectations going in, maybe. Yeah. (laughs) That at least takes some of the pressure off. Yeah, exactly. I think if I made a mistake, they wouldn't catch it. And that was just the rules of the game now, you know? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That first game, completely homebrew, but I think one of my favorites because that helped me kind of each session, I kind of learned a little bit more of how to how to run a game a little better. Was was the decision to do your first game as a homebrew, was that purely because you didn't have access to a, an adventure or module or was that your choice because you wanted to have it be your world i should clarify it started out as horde of the dragon queen okay i realized very early on i think by the second session that i didn't really like running modules yeah and i think a lot of it is preference but i i had a lot easier time running sessions that were able to be a little bit more forming to the characters themselves and the players themselves so that involved a lot of homebrew so it started out with a horde and then i kind of just used key elements from that book to kind of create their own journey that they were able to go on and ever since then I've awesome been mostly yeah homebrew. that sounds right. perfect i think that sounds like a really great way for a like a new dm to wet their feet wet their feet is that the phrase i always get phrases wrong wet your feet. yeah <laughs> i agree i think that it's i hear that's quite a railroady adventure i don't know if that's true but i hear it is and yeah i mean how do you keep a bunch of people in that rail road especially when you're still learning how to be a dm and that's that's hard work man i think you've done a great job of taking exactly just just take the bones of it you know and, and discard anything that doesn't work as bruce lee said absorb what is useful yeah you're so good with the quotes i could never remember a single one i'm like <laughs> that guy said a thing it was pretty cool <laughs> before we get too far 
I have two things. One, so you said when we started this and you were saying, this is how I got into D&D, you bought the player's handbook, the DM guide and the the monster manual. But before that, like, did you just happen to see them on a shelf and say, those look interesting, I'm going to buy them? Or was there something like, did you hear about it from your friends? Three of them. He must have had some idea. That's like 200 (laughs) bucks, isn't it? Uh, I saw... I saw a TikTok about Critical Role and that sparked my interest and I bought the books. All right. Uh, I was curious. I had to know where it was coming from, but no, that's amazing. So you weren't even familiar with Critical Role until that TikTok came up. Like Uh, you don't, you didn't watch the show or anything like that. No. Okay. You, you mentioned you're introverted and I find it very interesting that you are a DM and you say that you're, you're a little bit more on the introverted side because I feel like you have to go outside of your comfort zone to DM. DM, right? You are literally asking people to hang out with you and be in your space, which is like opposite of being an introvert. How do you, do you find any, like, I'm, obviously you must have challenges there, but how do you deal with that? I think it's something I've definitely learned throughout the years. I feel like when I start a session or when I get into a campaign, I, I get into almost like a character, different characters. So it's not me putting myself out there. It's whatever character I'm playing in that yeah. role. Or when it comes to DMing, I mean, I can just make calls and that's that. There's no do, do like, you have a kind of dm personality that you sort of take on if you like ex- yeah exactly storyteller yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i think once i'm in that zone it's, i'm not myself but just like taking on a new role where i am more extroverted and i'm able to get involved and be a little right. bit more social i right. see the That's... authority behind that sort of helps as well i suppose it does for me anyway what you said i i was curious because one of my best friends who i dm for she's in my game is what i, I would say pretty pretty introverted, very introverted. I actually had this conversation with her just last week. She came over for dinner and I was asking her about the, her, I don't know what, what to call it, introvertedness and how that plays into when she's at the table because it's almost, it almost seems non-existent when she's at the table. She's a completely different person. And then you take her off the table and she's, she's back to being who she is. And I was like, okay, so who is that? Who's that at the table? <laughs> and then she said, like, there's something about when you're playing D&D or, you know, whatever tabletop role playing you're, it, when she's role playing, she's yeah. not herself. She's someone else. And that's yeah. someone like, it's just wild. I don't even recognize her when she's at the table sometimes. <laughs> Right. So I just think that's really cool. I think it's really interesting. I feel like, I don't know, maybe in, in a realm where extrovert like me, <laughs> who are very like, yee and happy and out there and that, you know, like, I feel like there might be some kind of a negativity to being introverted. And I don't, I don't, I want to fight that because I see that in my best friend. And so I just want people to see that like being introverted doesn't necessarily, it's not a bad thing. There's just ways that they do things that are different than extroverts, you know? <laughs> I, I think too, I think the, it's crazy critical to create like a safe space at the table for those people to feel comfortable and opening themselves up and becoming that character. Right. Because when you have toxic table at all, or anyone who's maybe not being as receptive, it it is difficult, you know, and it's difficult as DM as well. I've had times where I have a hard time maybe reaching people or kind of like getting into that mode where I know people aren't as receptive or maybe they're kind of being a little uh, on the harsher side of the game. It does become a little bit more challenging. You know, let's, if you don't mind, Let's dig into that a little bit because Russell and I have talked a lot about how we manage our tables. I would really kind of like to hear how you manage. You mentioned something about like toxicity and trying to make sure people feel like they have a safe space. What have you, what do you, what do you do for that? How do you manage that? There's a lot of stuff I do beforehand before we start a session. If it's a new game at all, there's a lot of character building, obviously backstories, and then a lot of getting to know each other, especially if there's people that are friends of mine, but maybe not friends with my other friends I'll have them get together and kind of get to know each other as well as obviously session zero is essential and setting the expectations I've been lucky recently that a lot of my players they they respect those boundaries so if we have a hard line where it's like hey we absolutely we don't do this we don't do this we don't do this they'll respect it and they understand that being clear I think with the expectations and just trying to get to know each other before we even roll dice I think is essential so if, if this was a test that would be a perfect answer let's go <laughs> 
Rachel. A hundred percent gold stars everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> what about after session zero? Have you had any issues at your table that you had to kind of mitigate so that things didn't get worse? People want to leave the game. Have you ever had anything like that happen? Definitely. When I run, I've had the fortune, uh, the fortune of being able to run with friends. A lot of the times people are, we're all still comfortable playing at the table with each other and being able to, again, not cross any of those boundaries too harshly. So I think there's a little bit of push at times. I've mm-hmm. noticed I make it known, reach out if you have any feedback or anything. I always ask for feedback. Yeah. Like, right. what did you think? I, I, of course, I want the reassurance that I did a good job as right. well as anything I can improve on. I will right. absolutely take, just let me know what I can do. There's definitely been a lot of times where I've had uh, players come up to me asking to either change their character or have a new character or, Hey, I don't really like the way this character is kind of working for me. I'm like, okay, let's work around that. Let's do something else. And we, we want to make it fun for you. My, my whole deal at the table is always to put the players first because I want them to have. Right. I'm, I'm going to have a good time either way, regardless of whether they're playing a druid, ranger, barbarian. That doesn't matter to me at all. After a session, I just try to get that as much feedback as I can and kind of fix it moving on. I like that. What would you say, What if you had to tell someone now who's learning to DM, what would you tell them are your like top tips or your favorite things to do when you're DMing? During the session? like in During, game, before, already. or, you know, for any kind of prep or just any kind of thing to help someone who wanted to be a DM. We can go through all three. I think before the session, when you're prepping, don't over prep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a thing I always remember, the shiny penny, where you put so much detail on one little thing and that thing is perfect, but then everything else just kind of falls to the sideline. Just have a general story and be prepared to have it thrown to the side and do something else because not at 10 times, that's usually what happens. Before you move on, okay. because I don't want to forget. So you said don't over prepare. Someone asked me, how do you know when you're over prepared? If you're a new DM, how would how would you define that? I think for me, it's when it gets into, I, want, I don't want to say paragraphs, but like multiple paragraphs of a single point of interest, I think is usually where it, I feel like gets a little bit too much because of course you want to have depth to the places they're at but if you're adding so much detail to like a little thing like a shop that has a full backstory (laughs) and you know if it's going to be a really important shop for the rest of the campaign and everyone's going to spend their time in there all the time constantly with multiple sort of trips to the shop you might need a little bit more detail but that can kind of grow organically can't it right yeah exactly i think there's a lot of stuff that can be done in that moment and then keeping notes might be more important than making prep like that i like that answer though when there's more than a couple paragraphs for like a single point of interest that was a really great concise way to explain that because i have had trouble answering that i'm like how do you know when it's too much i don't know i'm terribly guilty for too much breath right me too too oh that's great advice all right so you said there were three things you said before the game what about during the game uh during the game i think you pointed out a really great one uh take notes i'll always have an empty notebook i wish i had it on me it's all (laughs) All over the place. I understand it. And it's stuff that I'll take into future sessions yeah. um, that kind of come up that I think are interesting. Like take note, try to be uh, mindful of what the characters are interested in right. or the players, right? Because I right. think I always want to, regardless of what the story I want to tell, if something else is interesting to them, I think it's better to go with that than to try to railroad. Yeah, yeah. to force them to be interested in the thing you wanted them to be interested in. Yeah, I think yeah. I have a great example of a recent a session. I had a whole plan, a well that kind of circled down and was an entrance to a little bit of like a I want to say it was a hag's layer or no sorry necromancer's layer mm-hmm. one of them stepped in and then set off a trap uh, they immediately walked out and left and decided to do something else like uh, the pages I had the map sketched out and everything and they just completely they're like uh, no we're not going to do that they were just uh, like ouch <laughs> that hurt I don't want to go in <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, okay <Wow. laughs> Man, I can't believe the rest of the party didn't like fight that and go, yeah, that but not very adventurous for a DD group, let's yeah. be fair. <laughs> That's <laughs> that was amazing some though. Cowardly, cowardly adventures right there. <laughs> oh, it's, might say that. Uh, it's really funny because you say that, and then I think I want to see four or five sessions later, I had a just a, a little bit of a world building aspect of like a big tower that was heavily guarded. I made it very clear that hey, this exists, but also this is way well, well out of your wheelhouse. Don't right. Go and yeah. they, they went full force. <laughs> You're like, why don't you go back to the lair? Why, why don't you go back? Yeah. To the lair? It was a, a trap, you know. Oh my god. <laughs> 
That's so funny. <laughs> Perfect. That's hilarious. Just rolling with the punches and kind of going with the flow and letting them do what they want. If they want to do it, yeah, it's their game by all means. Let yeah. let it happen. You know, they're having fun, and I'm not gonna. I, I, I hate taking that away from them. How, how do you feel in regards to players doing stupid shit? It's like for me, it's like you warn them. You make it clear that you're that if you do this, you're gonna die. Are you are you sure you want to do that? Like, how do you deal with that kind of angle of things? As long as I make it clear that they understand, like, hey, if you do this, there is a very high chance that you will not survive, and right. they decide to go through with it anyways. I let it happen. I, I think uh, it's you know if they're aware of characters? the risks. Sorry. Do you kill characters from time to time? I try not to. <laughs> uh, but have you have you done so? Uh, yeah, I definitely yeah. have. Right, it happens. Um, I think the recent player death was they were up against a dragon. Somebody uh, should die when you're fighting a dragon. There should be yeah. one player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there were Aerocrocra up in the air and you know I rolled really well. It happens. With that, there's a few routes I try to take with player deaths. I give them the option because I never want to just take away their character like, oh, well, he's dead. You're not getting him back. If you want him back bad enough, we can take that route. And that's just a new adventure. But right. you, you have to earn it. Like, I was talking to a, another DM friend of mine because he was having an issue with a lot of player death because uh -oh. he, he likes to have his games a little bit more challenging. But they got to the point where the player deaths were kind of not as impactful. So the player oh, died. They just were happening so often right. that they were like well i expected this yeah yeah right they're uh, becoming desensitized <laughs> yeah yeah they're just like oh well we're dead but it's okay we can just go to the cleric and bring them back i told them about uh i think this is something that uh critical role does where there's like a dc yeah uh, and every death the dc gets higher and higher um, yeah uh, uh, i try to i try to implement that, that as well but i also don't i don't like killing player characters unless it's it's um, never fun is it it's it's never the thing that you feel you never feel good about it. Yeah, I was yeah. just about to say I have yet to kill kill. I'm like I've killed a player, but then they they got revived, right? Oh. I've never had one where the or sorry, Amber, I didn't player. realize you were such character. An <laughs> I know. <laughs> 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 but the I haven't had one yet that hasn't been able to come back. That being said, we're coming to the end of my campaign, so that may not be true in a few mm -hmm. months. <laughs> so, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, Amber's got millions more questions. So. I do. I'm okay. just always full of questions. So let's see. We talked about your advice for before the game, during the game. I also wanted to tack on, because you were talking about notes. For those of you who are like me, I am horrible at notes. And I can't remember if I mentioned this on the show. I mm. try very hard. I probably get about half of what I want to get. And what I do get is usually not enough to go off of <laughs> when, when <laughs> we play monthly too. That's the other thing too. So there's a month that has gone by when I'm looking at my notes. We don't play weekly. Right. So what I do is I have my phone and I'll just hit the voice memo and just let it go and mm -hmm. then we play and i don't have to think about it and then when i'm ready to kind of capture notes i can listen to it again or even if it's AI to do it you get what you can get the ai to do it oh yeah we got to talk about that <laughs> that would be cool well, um, i'm doing it already that's what i do <laughs> but i will usually wait until like a week before the next session since we play monthly and then i can listen to it again and everything's fresh you know which is great so for those of you who are horrible at notes there's one option for <laughs> yeah record the game and get something to go through it and give you a transcript and then from the transcript you can throw that into gpt and then gpt can summarize it and pull out all the salient stuff it's so crazy <laughs> the third tip which i'm assuming is going to be post session right or or what is the third tip that you have uh i think yeah it was just post but now i think about it, i think we already kind of we covered it that. okay yeah we covered that pretty well <laughs> all right feedback and making sure everyone's good okay do you have a do you have a favorite i mean i know you you're more interested in homebrew stuff obviously because it's basically easier and smarter but uh, is there a campaign setting in D D that you do enjoy i i as far as modules, I do have a soft spot for Horde of the Dragon Queen. Right. Because um, that's what you started with, right? Uh, it feels yeah. like home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's the ease. I'm more familiar with it. The first part, the Dragon Raid, I think is a really fun idea to use for first time players. So they're able to role play and then immediately get into the action. I'll and... have to check it out. I've never run it. Oh, yeah. I think the first little bit is good. I think after the raid. Eh, then know. veer from there. Okay. Good yeah. to know. Good to know. I will but, look into that. Um, I'm also a big fan of anything dragons so Tiana Bahama I, I love them I love them all I love you, the well, well you probably like Dragonlance then you should get into that I own the book I haven't read it <laughs> oh no <laughs> 
get Chat GPT to do it. No. <laughs> That's Russell's answer. That's my answer to everything. Everything. Oh I, I'm God. basically designing a GPT that can replace me. That's my plan. Um, I mean, if you could have another you, how awesome would that be? Like to get stuff right. done? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, I wanted to see if we could talk about, since I mentioned that our guest here is going to be DMing at our table at the Dead Wars. Going to recap real quick for those of you who haven't caught our previous show shows. What's the Dead Wars? What What's is that? What's the Dead Wars? All that? right. If you look on the interwebs and you Google Dead Wars and you Google it for 2023, you will find out that in Provo, Utah, We Geek Together ran this session, which ended up becoming a world record. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the largest D&D game ever. And wow. I believe it was 1,200 people. This year, they're going to try to double that number. They're trying to make it to 3,000. I think it was 3,000. When we met with Andy Ashby, you can check out that, that interview. I'll put it up here again. He said, you know what? We're going to give you guys a table. And he gave us a table, which is fairly close to the stage. Very excited. We needed some, some folks to come play at our table. We're going to be there as Nerd News. We're going to be there reporting on the event. We're going to be talking to everybody. We're going to be interviewing everybody. And on top of that, we're going to have some players and our DM albert to run the game for us right. now dead wars this year is a little bit different than last year i'm going to have albert talk about last year because he was there nice. but this year it is going to be broken up into two days friday and saturday and actually you know what no zoop rewind i'm going to go ahead and have you talk about last year because what happens for this year is canonically in line with what happened last year so i think we should start with what happened last year if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your experience dming and kind of a little bit about what happened in the game like the story the plot anything like that that would be great dead wars last year very chaotic i remember a ton of people and being a local here in utah i've honestly never seen that many people at that mall <laughs> <laughs> really have you so you've been to the mall you've been to the mall before dead wars happened oh yeah i mean okay. I, <laughs> so close to where you live is it i take it yeah 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 uh, nice. so yeah seeing that many people was crazy a lot of people <laughs> i go into that game i was sleep deprived because i had just gotten out of work because they did it a little earlier than they're doing it this year and then just kind of scrambling to get as much as i could done last year i didn't have as much time as this year to be able to prepare right so a lot of it was just drawn maps just pdfs on my laptop ready to go so the way i understand it the way they did this last year was for anybody who was registered as a d they gave the DM like a packet of information and here's kind of your base data that you have for to run your session your on your table but they let the dms you could create your own maps you could create your own minis you could create right is that correct yeah yeah so every table even though they're all participating in the same game could kind of have like a little bit of a different setup depending on uh, you know i'm assuming here but it's obviously you've got uh, and we have talked about this so i kind of do know a little bit about it but i'm set asking these questions more for the audience but it, it could easily be interpreted that this is like a game with like 10,000 people in it and there's like how many DMs like what's going on here who's who's running this show how does it work right is it a bit like a sort of uh what do they call it the dread marches the west marches oh the west I think it's West March campaign. West March is what campaign. You're, it's I don't know because I've never participated in a West March campaign. But what I understood was that they had a stage and right. there was like a head table, a head DM on the stage. Uh, Albert, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And then they also had like runners that would go throughout the mall if, for those that were like on maybe the far edges and couldn't hear the main stage. Yeah. So they would be running like information or details to the further tables. And then there were like 200 DMs, I think, something around that amount the dms already they were they were just told like this is what you got to run we, we've talked about this before like this table over here is gonna try to climb the walls this table over here is gonna what was what was your table's objective uh we were taking posts at the entrance of the town and kind of just vetting people okay uh, i can't remember the name i want to say gatekeepers or something somewhere okay to that. Um, yeah and and the overall campaign uh plot was I think that there was Vecna, you're gonna have to correct me because I really don't know. All I know was Vecna was involved and that everybody was fighting Vecna. <laughs> 
<laughs> why don't you just tell us about it? You yeah. tell us. What it was yeah, about. sorry, we can stop guessing. You tell us. No, you're good. Uh, no, no, you're you're correct. There was Vecna. There was an onslaught of undead, kind of outside, and we're. I think we're trying to get every, uh, people in to safety and trying to prepare for the attack. It was interesting in the note, and they're running it differently this year. So I think I'm okay to kind of say the, the in the in the packet they gave us. There's little checkpoints to let us know if we pass or fail that encounter. So uh, for us, uh, we let people in and we, we, we kind of vet them, which I liked because I, I do enjoy the role play of like, you know, them talking and trying to figure out like if they're good to come in through, if they have the money, all that jazz. I had a little checklist of like the people that they're coming, if they can pass, if they go through and they'll give like a pass or fail. And once those runners come by at that time point, like, OK, did they pass or did they fail this initiative? You let them know. And that kind of affects the story uh, okay. um, from there out. And I believe I believe they failed overall Uh-oh. <laughs> uh oh, because I think if I remember the wall fell. And from there, it was just nonstop undead fighting. Uh, wow. Nonstop undead fighting. <laughs> yeah. That uh, sounds anyway. like a lot of fun. So I will be playing a cleric. <laughs> <laughs> that's honestly a good call yeah right now, do you, always a good call though. do you recall a moment when there was a god or goddess that showed up to kind of like save the day for a second do you remember that at all i remember they she was dressed up she was kind of walking around and helping everyone and, oh there uh, was actually an actress that was like portraying her oh that's mm-hmm. amazing okay wow that's cool yeah they would come to the tables and they would offer help to the players or uh some of the runners as well would kind of offer to the DMs, they'd roll a dice and then they'd whisper to me like, "Okay, go ahead and put an ogre zombie on the map, make it a little wow. bit more difficult." And so it was, it was very interactive, and they kind of, they would kind of help here and there. She didn't make a big splash until the end, if I remember correctly, because that was after Vecna had attacked. Once the walls fell, there were zombies, and they were falling from the air and the ground. They were falling from the air. Yeah, air <laughs> zombies. <laughs> air zombies. Yeah, wow. they, they had a lot of good stuff that to this day i actually do use in my campaign because there was a lot of fun stuff there were bomber zombies amazing. i had falling um, sheep in a game last night <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> falling sheep now they were being dropped on the players by a manticore though so to be fair anyway sorry <laughs> falling zombies okay keep going yeah, falling zombies and just a lot of it was just survive 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 until i think i believe it was the aspect of vecna that showed up uh-huh. and i wish i had a miniature for him because I would have, I had a Funko Pop ready to use, like the Vecna Funko Pop uh-huh. that I wanted to use as the miniature. Oh man, that's uh, amazing! Completely forgot it, unfortunately. <gasps> oh. so that was that was <laughs> bummer. Yeah, so they would attack him. I believe the goddess had gifted everyone. Yeah, they had a token, and it would turn into the spear, and they needed to attack him with the spear in order to inflict damage. At the end of the event, we took a rolling total of how much damage was inflicted on Vecna, and they added it all together. I didn't catch what they did on stage it was a lot of people unfortunately so right. but i know she rolled dice they added all that up and they made an announcement of they did this much damage to vecna slayed him all that jazz yeah a little foggy at the end unfortunately because my table was positioned a little further away from everyone else's so by the time i got there there was already a big crowd and a lot wow. of people I, I was gonna see if you remembered anything about a goddess dying because that is where this year's campaign picks up I remember. I think she lost her hand. I remember her losing her hand. Oh, okay. So she lost her hand. Yeah. I, you know, lost- I'm actually really interested to find out when we talk to people this year what they remember about that part. <laughs> Again, we did lose that first uh, bit when the walls fell and the uh, the city was being attacked, and I think she had to give up her hand to kind of help the players a little bit. Was like- there some sort of yeah. thematic connection between her losing her hand and the hand of Vecna? I'm sure there was. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I thought it was pretty neat. Like her sacrifice to kind of help defeat Vecna. Yeah. It was he was trying to take her place which was it was really interesting. I wish I would have been able to pay more attention to the overarching story but um a lot of I got a lot of people and then a lot of trying to make sure my uh, my table uh complete strangers so I wanted to put my a lot of my attention towards them. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. So wait, you DM'd for Perfect Strangers last year? Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so cool of you. I mean, were these people that like they couldn't get into the event till 
last minute um, or i think a few of them were a few of them were assigned to the table so we had one or two filled in and then the rest of them were backfill like people okay. that wanted to did you have any new effect. players there i did have one new player i believe she was playing a monk and i remember trying to help her out a lot just like it's hard work yeah, yeah. what a way the, to the most... like your first game ever is the world's largest game <laughs> Wow. That's crazy. It's wow. It's quite the feat, I think. It's very because it's very hectic. There's a yeah. lot of a lot of gears turning, a lot of dice rolling, and, a, and there's just I mean, so much going on. I think yeah. you just gotta keep keep in mind that first of all, it is just a game. You're not solving cancer or anything, you know? Right. It's just a fucking game. So you don't have to stress as much as you think you do. It's I know like for me personally, D D and role playing is like the whole world, right? And I, it's like so important to me. But I have to remember that in the in the real world, it's it's just again yeah and just have fun if you're having fun you're winning yeah yeah Yeah. so my understanding of this year's dead wars is that that goddess that came to help you all that she died or something happened to her and there was like a vacuum of power or there is now a vacuum of power and so this year the dead wars is that there is like i think demigods that are trying to fill this vacuum one is like a demigod of light and one's a demigod of dark or something to that effect one day's game on friday will Mm. be you'll either be battling the forces of light and then the other day on Saturday will be you're your battling the forces of darkness or vice versa. I'm not sure. I can't remember which day is which. So you could sign up to do one of those days or you could sign up to do both. And and canonically, they're both happening at the same time. So I'm actually quite interested to find out how if what we do on Friday has any kind of impact on Saturday or not. And then I guess Saturday we'll find out like who fills that that vacuum of power. That's that's my understanding of what the, the plot will be this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm also interested reading through the packets that I was able to get. It almost seems like they wanted to give a little bit more exploration to the players. while yeah. Still being able to affect the sto- story overall. Uh, they still have the three acts set up. Same thing. We're kind of like objective based act one, pass or fail, all that. Yeah. yeah there's not much on how on the conclusion. So your guess is as good as mine on how it'll. I'm so glad you're going to be like up front and center compared to last year, though. This is going to be great. You're going to know everything. (laughs) Do we get to interview you again after the event so that we can get a sort of what happened? You know, that'd be cool. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. I love that. If we don't get it there at the event, then we will definitely be talking to you. Then we'll definitely be doing this again. Yeah, we should we should meet up at the event, too. So everyone, if you are in the Utah area and you haven't heard about this and it's something that you're interested in, there is still time. Go check Mm. out the website. We'll put the links in the the, these blah blahs and those blah blahs. And yeah, sign up for it. You don't even have to be in Utah. You you, if you happen to be, you know, superbly affluent, I don't know, Elon Musk or somebody, you could just fly there on your jet or your helicopter. (laughs) I'm in New Zealand, so I've got a little bit of travel to get through to get to Utah. I won't be there anytime soon. (laughs) Right. I know. Actually, I don't know if you saw on our last video, it was my mom who commented and said, why can't people just donate miles to Russell so he can go? And I was like, oh, "Oh, that's sweet. I don't know if anybody will or if we'll have time to do that. But that was a good good Uh, idea. We should think about that for another time. Yeah. (laughs) If somebody's got like a buttload of miles and you want to see Russell there, like... (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. Contact us. I don't know how donated miles work. I'm going to come and hang out with Albert and, and we're going to talk shit between games. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So well, it's Albert, May 3rd what, and 4th. That's let right. me ask a question. Albert, what are you the most excited about for this Dead Wars game? What gets your gears going? I like seeing people's characters. I think yeah. That's always fun. I like to see the route they're taking and what they come up with. Yeah. Are there any rules about the characters, actually? Like, um, are there any restraints? restrictions racial restrictions levels i, think, I was gonna say i think they have to be like a level four level five uh, official wizards of the coast no third party level five level five characters with one magic item okay That's like a bad. uncommon or a rare does it say the rarity uh they have a table oh um, okay so you got to choose from the table you can choose from yeah okay fascinating and yeah. if you're in the area it looks like you can actually go to their shop at their tavern and get an extra magic item through them Ooh. <laughs> 
Ooh. Hey, local folks, you get a cool little extra thing if you go to We Geek. I can say it. We Geek Together <laughs> in the Provo Mall. That's a, you know, Andy's always so good about that. He's so good about getting people in his shop. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So May 3rd and 4th. If you haven't signed up for it yet, sign up for it. Come see us. Even if you haven't signed up for it, come see us. Say hi. Come say hi to Albert. You might be able to be a player at his table. <laughs> and, and I hear he's nice and he doesn't like killing player characters. So, you know, there you I, go. I don't, I don't like to. It doesn't mean I won't. Oh, uh, make the, that clear. There's, there's a, a stick. There's yep. a I'm no, not killing right. player characters at all intentionally. That, I want to make that clear. That's right. not my it. intention. Right. If you die, it's because you are stupid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you did a thing you weren't supposed to do. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's get to know Albert a little bit. Let's do some <laughs> rapid fire questions and get to know him. I always like to start with what's your favorite gaming snack? If you're if you're at the table, what what's the thing you like to snack on? Um, These are important questions, Albert. What are they? <laughs> Salami. 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 Slices. I'm with I, you. Yeah. That's a good one. I have not heard that. It's like, you know, meaty and salty and hmm. mm -hmm. all right. What about Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, Star Wars for the nostalgia. But recently I have been getting into Star Trek. I was watching Picard, the new series that came out and I thought it was pretty yeah. interesting. Definitely yeah. caught my eye. Now, right. before you watched Picard, had you already seen Star Trek The Next Generation? No. Uh, the, my only media I'd consumed from Star Trek were the Chris Pine movies. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So, wow, that's really interesting. I've never, I don't think I've so, met someone who only started with Picard and didn't have all that like backlog of knowledge really, and, and you still really, like it. That's great. Uh, well, let's be fair. I mean, they're all being directed by the same dude now aren't they it's all zach is it zach snyder doing am, am i wrong i don't know I you're the remember. one who remembers directors but it's shocking though because we had like the star wars movies being directed by the same guy that's directing the star trek movies and i'm like really like you, you really couldn't just find another director we're just gonna have one guy that does everything <laughs> i guess if you like one right then you know if he's directing it then right. everyone will like it right albert since you're a comic book person What's your favorite comic? Is that hard? Is that a hard question? Or like, what's your uh, favorite comic book character? If you want to get that granular. <laughs> uh, definitely Spider-Man. Anyone who knows me knows I am obsessed with Spider-Man. Uh, I wish I could bring the camera. I have a whole shelf just for Spider-Man Funko Pops and action figures. Just wow. fully decked out. Spider-Man, wow. Yeah, all, if you all can, my favorite. If you can take a picture of it for us, I can put it up on the screen when we edit oh, this. Yeah, so. <laughs> absolutely. I'll, I'll send that over. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, of course. We well, got to see this. Think, oh, what was the, there was a recent Spider-Man film. Um, it was kind of animated, but it had all these it all the different Spider Mans from into different... the Spider Verse. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah into the Spider Verse. What did you yeah. think of that? Oh, I, I loved it. Love it, it, yeah. I it, it, was it, it was great. It was great. Story writing, animation. That was one of my favorites for sure. Right. I was actually, I went in going, I don't know if I'm going to like this. And right. then I left and I was like, wow. oh, that was really cool. That was really different. <laughs> I liked it a lot. So Spider-Man comics and also Spider-Man is your favorite comic book character. Yeah. <laughs> How many comic books do you have? Like, do you have a lot that it's like, oh my gosh, I can't count them or? I have a good, like a regular comic book box full. I saved the ones I had from when I was a kid. I'll pick up the ones that I like in particular. As far as reading them, I usually just go digital. Okay. So, so I'll, you, I'll you're really favorites. collecting them at for the co the collection aspect and not picking them up to to read them. Yeah. Once I, once I got to the point where I needed the box, I was like, okay, I need to slow down and <laughs> just, just <laughs> pick the ones i like i think right fun. fair enough i've got a question obviously you played dnd you've been playing dnd for well at least four years you've been dming for four years so i'm assuming you might have played a little bit longer than that maybe but my other question my real question is have you played any other role-playing games besides dnd that's a good question actually our current game well, one of them uh we have rotating dms at our table so each player will also eventually dm their own uh story and we're actually currently playing a fallout 2d20 game oh that's cool yeah that uh, it how does that work is that uh it was really interesting because it was far apart from what i was used to and there's not a lot of information on it as well so there was a lot of research going in but is this, this is post-apocalyptic kind of sci-fi i'm assuming yeah so it it's based in the fallout universe uh my friend he's the fallout geek i i've only played 
part of Fallout 4 and then never finished it. So is it uh, better not knowing too much about the universe? I think so. I've I've had a lot a lot, a lot of fun with it because there's so, some stuff that I think are obvious to them but not obvious to me. Right. Yeah. So with you're, like you're you're you exploring. To, in right. That. I was gonna yeah. say discovering. Yeah. 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 Sorry. But, okay. No, it was just it was really fun kind of learning a new system and playing it because it's it's completely different. I think it's better than trying to convert, which I think you can. You can convert the ND five E to the specifications of fallout but in this one it's more survival and travel based like more narrative right more with like you're struggling you i think you get up to like 15 16 hit points max depending on right. and that's at max level has oh, your wow. experience of playing another role-playing game like this one um changed or otherwise added to or transformed in any way your way of thinking about dungeons and dragons and role-playing yeah i think so i think learning about that and learning the different game it is but it's a whole new game i think uh different what, mechanics everything right yeah i think helped me understand like D 5e is meant specifically for the fantasy and adventure right. and you want to play it to its strength so it kind of helped me learn about other games out there like kids on bikes and i think there's a marvel multiverse there's a role-playing game for skyrim uh oh, wow. and dark souls so you know mm -hmm. it's like it's the as D, D is the most popular and i enjoy it i love it so much mm -hmm. but it it's not a one size fits all right yeah yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of what i learned playing other games i really yeah. like that <laughs> Russell, you asked some really great questions. We were supposed to be doing rapid fire, but those are really great questions. Well, I love them. Just throw them in there. <laughs> I had to be useful in some way. I mean, <laughs> boy, now I'm like, well, what question do I ask? That even sounds great after that. <laughs> You've played, what was it you said? Fallout. And you've mentioned some other ones. Is there one that you would like play that you haven't yet? Does Warhammer count? Is that different? I, I've heard yeah. about it. I don't know anything about it, but I, I've War, seen Are you talking about Warhammer, the, the battle, ma oh, sorry, the, the, the board game? What am I trying to say? The war game or the role-playing game? There are two different versions. Oh, are there? Yeah. I yeah. did not Warhammer know that. Warhammer is a role-playing game. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's also like Warhammer 40K as a role-playing game where you can run around in cyberpunk fucking what are they uh steampunk mix oh okay like that. i thought anyway. it, they were all just the same game i didn't even realize that there were different yeah, different versions. aspects of them you, i mean you can even there's a world of warcraft role-playing game too yeah so wait so what was it you were interested in albert i'm sorry uh warhammer <laughs> uh, that's all new information to me as well like i got oh, okay I, i've heard of it i've seen it I know Henry Cavill's been working on some stuff there. And I was like, okay, oh, right. hey, that looks interesting. How do I get into it? Um, right. it seems Henry like Cavill fun. seems to find his way into our <laughs> episodes. We're going to have to have him on our show. That'd we talked cool. about him last time. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what his his fee would be. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh, I would I would die if we had him on the show. I would die. Have you been to any cons? I've been to the Fan Act local con here in Utah. Okay. I was there when they first announced it, and I've been going ever since. I actually met my wife at the con. Oh. Oh, wow. wow, that's so cool. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Have you been to any other cons or just, just that one for now? Just that one for now. So okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. If you could take something like a book or series or movie or anything like that and turn it into like homebrew it and turn it into a game even if it's even if it already exists that's fine i mean there's probably you could probably name something and it does exist and we don't even know it if there was I some kind of a book spider-man is it spider-man spider-man that one's a pretty spider-man role-playing yeah. game <laughs> Uh, well, everyone has to play Spider-Man from different multiverse, you know, you know. Oh my God, that would be so much fun. And then you could have that moment where all the Spider-Men are like. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that is a thing. I think there's a Marvel multiverse role-playing game. Yeah. Yeah. It, and you can I, play all the different Spider-Mans. I, I think so. I'm not sure. That would be a but lot of fun. That one's caught my interest. There's actually a, a video game I really like that I think would lead really well to the role-playing aspect it's called Infamous. It's an older video game oh I, I think i've heard of that one oh like different superpowers that are elemental based i think would be really cool and like a it's almost like a cyberpunk-esque type of universe but not quite it's like getting to that point okay it would be really interesting that's the one i could think of that i haven't seen yeah i think i the idea i have i have yet to play in a game that isn't in a fantasy realm i think mm. that's what i'd i'd mm. really like to do i know russell's been trying to rope me into vampires so it's gonna happen yeah. sometime but <laughs> I'm, I'm a big vampire the masquerade player dm oh that, that's another one i need to check out yes you uh, do yeah yes, you, you can join me when i play with with russell 
<laughs> yeah, um, I'm down. <laughs> awesome. My final get to know you question. If you could go back in time and tell yourself one thing, what would you tell yourself? <laughs> Aside from like, you know, invest in Google or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you could. That That's could what be I was answer. Saying, right? In video, <laughs> probably just take it easy. It's not that serious. Right. A lot of my youth, I spent stressing out and worrying about one thing or another. And now it's, yeah. it, it, it's never that serious. Yeah. It's always hindsight, right? When you look back and you're like, man, what was I so worried about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in the moment, it feels like such a huge thing. You just can't talk yourself down from it. And then there are other things where you're like, why was I so relaxed about that? I probably should have been paying attention. <laughs> That is also true. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, maybe that's not sound advice. So. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh, man. Well, folks, we are hitting up on the end of our show. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for meeting Albert with us. Yeah. Albert, thank you for joining us. Thanks for us having us in your living rooms or phones or whatever it is that you're watching this on. If you want to know more, if you want to see more, obviously you can reach out to us on all our web pages. Uh, join our Discord. We're a bunch of creatives that just love to hang out and talk with each other talk at each other but if you're gonna be in the utah area around may 3rd and 4th come see us personally well me and albert at least unless you want to donate miles to russell because he lives very far away <laughs> you know what we should do russ is we just need to have like a big giant screen at our nerd news table and just have you live stream like for two days straight can you just be with us like two days <laughs> that would be just a cardboard cutout <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, we should charge to be like take a picture with Russell and we could have like a life size stand. Oh, that would be I'm Do getting anyone cares enough to, to... <laughs> Here's 10 cents. I don't know who this guy is, but I'll <laughs> That's amazing. So anyway, folks, I hope to see you there at Dead Wars. Uh, we will be covering all kinds of things and sharing what we can with you throughout the next few weeks. Mm, so I'll be expecting a full report. Full report. There will be so it's two days worth of stuff. There's gonna be so much to report on. Right. All right, folks. I think I've ran out of air. That's probably a first. <laughs> So, all, all right, right, folks, it's good night from me. It's good night from Russell and Albert. Mm -hmm. Everybody, we will see you next week. Thank you so much. Adios. Goodbye. Zajian.